Hi, and welcome to another episode of LVP Conversations. I'm so excited to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Lisa Wong. It's very difficult to summarize all of her accomplishments and her work in just a couple of sentences, but I will try my best. Um, so Dr. Lisa Wong is a musician, arts education advocate, and pediatrician at Milton Pediatric Associates in Massachusetts. She currently serves as an assistant professor of pediatrics and associate co-director of the Arts and Humanities Initiative at Harvard Medical School. And she also teaches a seminar on the role of music in education and health at Harvard College. She is so dedicated to healing the music, healing the community through music. And she served as the president of the Longwood Symphony Orchestra for over 20 years. And she helped create the Symphony Signature Healing Art of Music program, which has benefited over 50 medical nonprofits in Boston. And among other things, she has received so many different awards for her work and her book, Scales to Scapples, Doctors Who Practice the Healing Arts of Music and Medicine was published in 2012. So hello and welcome, Dr. Lisa Wong. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm so excited. How are you doing today? Hi, it's really great to meet you and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Yeah, so my first question is, when did your musical journey begin and what are some of your most memorable experiences as you were learning how to play different instruments and just learning more about music as a whole? Sure, you know, I was, um, I was fortunate to be in a big family. I'm the middle child of a family of five kids. And although my parents were not musicians, they were, my mother was an educator and my father loved music. And so they just let us have uh, as much opportunity to explore music as uh, we wanted to. And so when my older sister started the piano um, at a normal age of seven, I was, I was three. And so whenever she finished playing, I jumped up on the piano and just repeated everything that I had just heard. And so um, then they realized that they should give me piano lessons too. And so I would take lessons. We had somebody who came into the house and, and taught, so I would take lessons after my sister. But it wasn't until I was about eight years old that they discovered that I actually didn't know how to read music. I just knew how to copy my sister, who I, who I um, had idolized. And so the, the new, new piano teacher gave me music that my sister hadn't played. And so I would immediately say, I don't like this piece unless you play it for me. Um, and so they, they, they caught on. So I had to actually learn how to read music at that point. Um, but my parents, my father um, also did it, something else was, I thought was really, really smart. And I hadn't realized at the time, which was um, after we mastered the piano, uh, not mastered it, but played it out for a few years, he said, well, you're good enough so you can choose a different instrument. So he gave us the privilege of choosing a second instrument rather than saying, now you have to play two instruments. And so uh, each of us ended up playing piano plus something. So I played um, violin. My brother and sister who are older than me also played violin and piano. Then my younger sister played uh, cello and my younger brother played uh, the trumpet. And so there was a lot of practicing and a lot of music going on um, around the house at all times. That's wonderful, very musical family, yeah. Um, so what inspired you to bridge the two disciplines of music and medicine? And when did you discover this passion of yours to explore the healing powers of music? Yeah, I was always interested in um, what made people feel better, I think. Um, and I didn't realize till I look back that I really liked reading stories about um, doctors and patients and nurses and, and caring. And even when I was reading picture books and um, Part of the thing about being in a musical family is then you are taken to, you know, we played at church and we played in hospitals, we played for our grandparents and it was just part of what we did. And so I didn't realize that how uh, deeply that had impacted all of us. And so by the time I was in high school, I was volunteering at, um, at a hospital and I was, um, we grew up in Hawaii. So I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. And there, there was a, um, a hospital that was walking distance from our my school and we would it was for children who had had uh, orthopedic uh, anomalies when they're born and they had them corrected um, like club foot or something and so these kids mainly were coming from other islands and from Samoa and so that their family wasn't around so they were in pain they were recovering they couldn't walk and they're lonely because their parents were not 
brought with them. So my friends and I would bring our instruments and play music for them uh, in the afternoon. And we saw what a difference it made. The kids would be perked up and they would be laughing and you know, we'd bring uh, ukuleles and guitars and recorder. And as I said, since my, my family had a lot of uh, music interests, we just had lots of musical instruments around the house that we experimented with. And so I saw the difference that it made. And so by the time I got to um, Harvard, it was, um, I was determined to be in something with kids because I love playing with the kids, something with music and something um, with healing and education. So the whole thing came together when I got to college. I really didn't know I was going to be a pediatrician. Um, and during, I had a freshman seminar uh, and it was actually, it was expository writing. And the writer uh, teacher said, well, if you are trying to figure that out, then you're going to write a piece about different places every, you know, every week. So I went to Mount Auburn Hospital and I observed there. I went to Buckingham Brown and Nichols Elementary School and I observed the kids there. I went to concerts and I observed concerts and I had to write my um, observation pieces about each one. And that really helped me to pull my thoughts together um, about what I was going to do next. That's amazing. You know, it's wonderful that you had, you know, that mentor who really encouraged you to, you know, bridge those, you know, very, I guess, different disciplines, but also very similar at the same time. So that's wonderful. Yeah. So a little bit about our project. So our mission as the Little Virtuosos Project is to help spread awareness about the positive impacts music has on the brain and including child brain development and learning. So I wanted to know what are your thoughts on early music education for children and as a pediatrician, um, how have you incorporated music into caring for your patients? Yeah, that, so that's exactly why I started this course. I, I've been teaching a junior seminar in MBB for four years um, called the role of music in education and health um, because there's so much great literature out there now about the impact that early um, music education has on the developing brain. And also there's so much more knowledge about neuroplasticity and that doesn't, how that doesn't end. It slows down, but um, playing music all your life can continue to be changing your brain. And I was also wondering for the last number of decades, why it is that there's so many um, people in healthcare who started off as musicians um, and what happened to our brains as kids when we started our instruments and didn't think we were going to be doctors yet or nurses or physical therapists. But then we continue to love our music and then we applied what we learned to um, caring for patients. So it's all tied together. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask how has music offered you a different perspective on the practice of medicine and if it has changed your view on what it really means to be a caregiver and just being a compassionate person for your patients? Oh, what a beautiful question. Um, yes, I think one of the, the wonderful things about early um, music education is that children are challenged to put themselves in the shoes of someone else, even then, it, as a means of expression. So even when they're playing um, just children's songs on the piano, it's, you know, play this one happy, play this one sad. Um, how, does, how would it sound if it sounds more lonely? And so kids have to translate their emotional states into an aural experience with their hands. So they're using so many different uh, parts of their brain and, and also trying to express themselves. And so I think that all helps to think of, it helps, helps people to um, then translate it as they get older. They're used to expressing themselves that way. And also then when you get into chamber music or playing with others, you're really learning to listen to the opinion and the musical uh, expression of somebody else and then trying to accommodate that. And, and the, the back and forth in chamber music or in, um, in singing or in musical theater, when, when you have that kind of musical conversation, um, that actually really helps in, in, in uh, caregiving patients. There are lots of times when I remember that when I'm listening to a patient and I don't remember who said it in music, but they said, you know, the silences are just as important as the notes. And it's so much the same in clinical settings. When you're sitting to a patient, 
just being trained to be silent with a patient and then to listen for what they're going to say next. That takes a lot of training to be open to that and then to, to learn how to respond. Yeah, definitely. I've learned a lot just from chamber music, you know, a lot of collaboration. I'm sure you use that a lot, you know, as a pediatrician and just as a healthcare worker. So it's really, really wonderful perspective on and, that. And there's also on, yeah. on the, just the more literal level, um, when we have, when I have a newborn or I have a fussy two month old or something, if I start singing to them, they will, you know, their eyes will get big and they'll quiet down and then I can hear their hearts or they'll lie still or, you know, so um, very often you can just do that. And then whenever I give shots, we sing old McDonald had a farm um, and, oh. and they get so used to it. They come to see me every year that even now my teenagers who come for their flu shots start singing before I even sing. And um, <laughs> the whole idea is you, you have them choose an animal like, you know, with a quack quack here or with a moo moo here. And so they're thinking old McDonald had a farm all the way to where they sing the animal sounds, but the shot only takes like one second. So they're singing old McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, but their, so their shot is already in and they never get to the sound, but they're thinking beyond that. So they're not thinking of the moment that the mm. shot is gonna hit them. Um, so, and then they're also giggling. So it makes the shots a lot easier. Yeah, that's a wonderful technique. I think you're the only person that I know <laughs> who's used that and that's the first time I've heard it. So that's, that's <laughs> amazing, yeah. Um, could you share a little bit more about uh, your work in the Longwood Symphony Orchestra? And you've written an incredible book about this called Scales to Scalpels. Could you share a little bit about what makes this orchestra so unique and some experiences that you've had while being in this ensemble? Sure. I started in this orchestra when I was a senior resident at Mass General. So I was, um, I had come out of New York and I played my music right through medical school and then played in a community orchestra as an intern and a junior resident. And, and then I was looking for another place to play in senior year and the Longwood Symphony was just starting up. Uh, it was started by two chaplains in the Longwood medical area we were medical schools um, uh, area where all the hospitals are, are collected. And um, they, they had noticed also that they, these chaplains are musicians and they noticed that whenever they played chamber music, the people that they're playing with were all in the medical field. So they said, I bet we could start an orchestra. And so they just put up a sign and within, within um, not very long, they had 90 people in this orchestra. So I came in uh, and the, during the, the first year that it had uh, really started to organize. And over time, we started realizing that number one, we we're it was a healing process for us to be in the orchestra. Um, it was also not difficult to find people to play in this orchestra. It was a very big orchestra, and um, we started wondering, well, what it is, what is it that you know makes it so easy? And so I, I became very interested at that point of um, why there are so many musicians that grew up to be doctors, and that's been sort of my life story since then. But what set Longwood Symphony apart was we also realized that just playing music together was not enough. Um, that was great. And it was like we did when we were in college and high school. And um, that was healing for us. But we felt like there was something missing. And it wasn't until we added the Healing Art of Music program, um, which was in engaging with community partners who are nonprofit organizations and partnering with each concert uh, to raise awareness about a medical need um, or an organization and then help them to learn how to raise money around our concert. That gave us the third, the third part of the stool that helped us to balance. And so we've done that ever since. And the orchestra is now 35 years old and um, every single concert is partnership with a local nonprofit organization. And I'm really proud to say that all of the organizations we've worked with, except maybe one are still viable nonprofits doing good work in the community. Wow, that's incredible. That sounds like such an amazing ensemble. I wanted to ask, how was it like balancing and continuing your musical journey as you were you know, training to become a physician? How was that experience like? And uh, were there any challenges that came up just having to balance these two things? Yeah, there always is. And, <laughs> and this has actually been, uh, I think, 
that's that's the thing. One of the things that brought all of us together in the orchestra is that we all knew that we all had this challenge, but um, it uses a different part of your brain. Or, and, and, and so what's been remarkable for me was um, seeing all of my colleagues who are uh, you know, pediatric surgeons or emergency room physicians or running a major lab doing stem cell research. And they all come in sort of at seven o'clock stressed and exhausted. And they sit down and within about 10 minutes, all of that falls away and you become a, an orchestra musician again uh, in the good sense of the word. And, you know, everyone works together to create a beautiful piece and to play something that none of us would have been able to play by ourselves. So um, it's something about the privilege of being able to play the symphonic music um, that really makes it special because I don't think I would have ever played, you know, all four Brahms symphonies or the Mahler, Mahler Second Symphony and, you know, all of these different things. And then to add on to that, knowing that we're doing something to help Boston Healthcare for the Homeless or the Albert Schweitzer um, Foundation or, you know, the Hemophilia Association, there's all these, so the, the, the way that we can weave these together in those three hours once a week that we're together is, is really a privilege. Yeah, for sure. So both before and I guess during the pandemic, how has music benefited your mental health and how have you seen it benefit the mental health of others? There's a lot of interesting things that happen. You know, we had to pivot because the orchestra is dark. You know, the, 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 the halls are closed. The orchestra can't get that. We can't get together because of course there's too many of us. Um, and so we've met together on Zoom and, um, but what has come from it is something there's, an ensemble that started called the National Virtual Medical Orchestra, uh, where it's actually made up of about 10 medical orchestras from around the country, um, from California and uh, Rhode Island and Nebraska and Texas. So there are, there are medical orchestras all over the country and we've always known about each other and sort of communicated, but we've never really been able to come together. So we do this virtually, you know, we record our parts and then they, um, have an engineer put it together. And so that's been interesting, particularly because we can meet these other um, people from these other orchestras, which I, I think is really cool. Um, but the, the thing that's been fulfilling for me is um, during, the, during the first surge in uh, April in Boston, they opened uh, the, the Boston Convention Center, turned into a field hospital and they opened some, something called the Boston Hope Hospital. And um, we were called upon not Longwood, but some people from Longwood, but musicians around the whole community were called on to um, donate music for the patients that were there because they saw that these are recovering patients who needed to recover not only uh, their respiratory status, but also um, their, their mental health. And so uh, people donated five minutes of their own playing recorded. And uh, there's a composer, who, um, Andres Ballesteros from Harvard, and he um, would put together playlists. And so we had three types of playlists, energy in the morning, in the middle of the day, and evening calm uh, for, for sort of settling down before sleep. And so there are these playlists that we uh, presented to them and they could access them on their tablets. And the Boston Hope Hospital closed uh, after about eight weeks, unfortunately. And so but the music lives on at um, on a website on bostonhopemusic.com, and then we pivoted from there and we said, well, who else? We noticed actually what we noticed was the music was helping the caregivers as much as it was helping the patients, and so um, we have partnered with New England Conservatory and Mass General to provide um, private lessons for um, front frontline healthcare workers, and that's turned out to be a really um, wonderful program that has been educational and healing for both both ends the the teaching artists who are from who are graduate students from NEC and uh, the physicians and nurses who are taking lessons. Wow that's incredible you know helping both the patients and um, the caregivers too wow it's amazing yeah you are you know a strong arts education advocate and I was wondering if you had any advice on how we as students can help best advocate for the implement implementation of creative arts 
into school systems and healthcare settings and just help spread more awareness about the healing benefits of music? There, I, I think um, those of you who are students and musicians who know that that has helped you, um, you're the most important voice for this. And um, knowing that, that music is helping people on all levels um, from infancy through um, to the end of life uh, is, is something that we can all advocate for. Uh, there's a, a couple of really good moves that are afoot right now, which is um, there was something called the STEM to STEAM movement that started about 10 or 15 years ago, where it's not just STEM education that's important for children, it's STEAM where A is the heart of it, standing for art. Uh, and um, now the AAMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges and the National Academies of Science, Medicine and Engineering have both written position papers about how important arts and humanities are in the study uh, and continuing um, education of uh, the arts, even if you're going into a science field. And the more we, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, but all, a, a lot of what I've been trained in, in observation and hearing and listening and discerning small subtleties of sound all came from my musical training and then applied to use in, in medicine. And even, I mean, this is not new. Um, when you're listening to a heart, the heart murmur, it's described as a musical murmur. It's described as a decrescendo murmur or a, a, a crescendo murmur, a staccato cough. Uh, you know, there's a lot of musical terms that are put into, uh, in, in, into medicine. And that's because most people who are in medicine are also uh, physicians. Well, actually my favorite story is Johannes Brahms, whose um, very close friend was Theodore Billroth, uh, who was the chief of surgery at the University of Vienna. And it was Billroth who invited Brahms to come to Vienna uh, where, where he did all of his best work. Um, because uh, Bill Roth, the surgeon, was also Bill Roth, the pianist, violinist, and violist. And so during the day, Bill Roth was inventing some of the life-changing surgeries that are still going on today with, uh, for cancer, um, laryngectomies and uh, uh, um, two different procedures for cancer of the stomach, diff different kinds of things. So during the day, he was doing that. In the evenings, he would have Brahms and his friends over and they would play through all of the newest works that Brahms had written and they would dissect those. And so there was this balance between the, the two. And so Brahms actually uh, ended up dedicating his Opus 51 string quartets to Bill Roth, which he would be remembered, the quartets would be remembered more than him. And he was actually absolutely right. Yeah, that's incredible. I actually started, I'm a couple of chapters into your book and just read about that particular story and you know it's incredible how you know we don't really know about like musicians who have interacted with you know medical doctors or have medical training themselves so it's just really cool how you know these two disciplines have been you know integrated throughout history so yeah it's amazing absolutely throughout history yep mm -hmm. yeah so my last question is do you have any words of wisdom for students who wish to pursue a career in medical in the medical field while also pursuing their love for music and just any, you know, last thoughts about that. Yes. Um, follow your follow your heart on both. Um, don't be afraid of people are going to say it's a lot of work to be in medical school, which is true. But um, I, I found that going back and playing your music is actually a way of helping you balance. And lots of times when you're playing and you're in the, that flow, the things that you were trying to stuff into your brain, all the facts start to sort themselves out. And, and so that's, it's actually helpful for you to do that. Um, it can be done. Uh, you can't do the five or six hours of practicing a day that some of you may have been doing, um, but that may be a healthy thing. So, you know, be good to yourself. I think there are certain years that you will, that music will take a backseat for a little while, um, but don't put it away forever. 
Um, but if you do put it away for a long time, there's a number of people in, in the orchestra who actually stopped playing for 10 or 15 years and then came back to it. Um, and their music was different and in lots of ways wiser and um, that much more rewarding because they almost saw it slip away. So um, just know that you can always pick it back up. That's great, thank you so much. Well, thank you for your passion and uh, I look forward to all of you being back on campus soon.